Amanda, can you hear me okay? She said she typed yes, so you can get started. Okay, I can't see that part. I'm looking for someone to just confirm that they can see my presentation. The chat goes away once I start sharing. I'll see if I can. Yeah, we, we see your presentation. Wait just a second, I haven't pulled it up yet. Or has somebody else pulled it up? I mean, we see your screen is what I'm saying. Oh, okay, I got you. Okay, great, all right. I was just clarifying there. Okay, so I'm gonna open this up for you guys. What a challenging way to begin your week. All right, we are gonna go ahead and get started. Thank you for being here today. And um, Carly, do you wanna say anything before I start or do you want me to just get started? You just get started, thank you so much. Okay, I sure will. Welcome everyone, I'm Cindy Percy Coe with Health Advocate. We are your partner for Employee Assistance Program, EAP Services, and also Advocacy Services. And glad you're here today to hear about the mental health side of managing money. It's something we don't hear a lot about, and we're going to incorporate some of how we can help you in EAP with also some general uh, money management tips. And I know you have an action-packed uh, information coming at you from all other partners as well on this topic. Um, it's such a great topic to focus on, and it's a big source of stress, as we see in EAP all the time, from couples arguing about money to people trying to decide um, you know, how to face up to their spending plan when they know they should have one, but they don't. So we're going to talk about some of those aspects as well. I am a licensed mental health counselor, and I'm also a certified employee assistance professional. Uh, so thanks for hanging in while we had a little bit of a delay uh, getting started from uh, a challenge there on, on you guys. But we're going to go ahead and start with just a brief reminder about the EAP program. I know many of you have heard about the Employee Assistance Program. Many of you use it. But I just want to remind you that you do have between one and six confidential sessions that are already paid for by the district. And that covers you any family members that are in your household, anyone up to age 26 who is your dependent, no matter where they live, your parents are covered, parents-in-law are covered, and they have between one and six sessions per issue per year as well. Uh, so we're providing a lot of virtual sessions. You can text with a counselor, you can do a phone session, and in some locations, there's some in-person sessions uh, starting to be available. So I'm gonna give you our number, encourage you to put it right in your phone. This is the same number if you wanna reach the EAP team or if you wanna reach your advocacy team. And that's the team that can help you sort out medical bills, help you arrange a second opinion. Maybe you or someone in your family has a new medical diagnosis and you'd like to understand it better, speak to a doctor or a nurse and understand your treatment options. All of that can be accessed through EAP um, Health Advocates number, the EAP and the advocacy. So the number that you guys would call um, is going to be, okay, it is an interesting Monday for all of us here. My little uh, uh, information just disappeared on me. Um, at any rate, you will be able to get this in the chat as well, but it's 877-477-3722. And that number is answered 24-7. In addition to the services I just described, you can also speak to a team uh, that helps people balance their work and family life. So maybe you're looking for a summer camp for your kiddos. Maybe you need home health for an aging parent. Um, that is also covered inside the EAP and the health advocate team. We also have a team of financial experts, especially on the topic we're covering today. If maybe you wanna to speak to somebody about how you're doing your budget, which credit cards to pay off first, um, you know, planning for retirement, those services are available inside EAP as well. And then we have a team of attorneys available to you as part of the health advocate team as well. So you've probably heard me say before, no problem is too big or too small. We encourage you to reach out to us. If it is for counseling, um, we will match you to the best of our ability with a counselor who is in the EAP network, but who's also in your medical plan network. And that way, if you need more 
than the six sessions covered in EAP, um, you could stay with that same counselor you've already opened up to. And um, at that point, co-pays and deductibles would apply. Um, and we go over all that with you. So whether you're dealing with a financial issue, um, and sometimes people are and they need help on the counseling side. Remember that example I gave of a couple arguing about money, for example, or disagreeing about major purchases, things like that. Uh, they may need some help communicating more effectively with each other. And then they might also need one of our financial professionals to help them with how to have a better plan for their money. So sometimes people are, are working with more than one professional on the health advocate team at the same time. So it's a great benefit. It's a really rich benefit. It is confidential. Unless you tell us about a life-threatening situation, we cannot disclose to anybody that you've used our service. Um, so if we can help in any way, we want to make sure you know Health Advocate is here for you. And that can be a great takeaway for you from our session today. So we're going to talk about some practical tips for managing our money. We're going to talk about what happens when we get in over our head. And especially during the year and couple of months that we've all just lived through, many of us have been more uh, in front of our computer screens, it's been tempting to shop. It's been tempting to gamble. It's been tempting to eat out and try to get comfort that way. And so a lot of people are kind of trying to hit the reset button and say, you know, how do I really want to be spending my money and taking a fresh look at it? So we're going to talk about that a little bit today, as I said earlier, from a mental health perspective and also from a financial perspective, kind of blending those two. And I'm going to speak for about half of our time together, and then I'm going to stop and we'll have some time for some Q&A. We'll have some time to share best practices. Uh, so that will be available to you as well. So let's go ahead and get started. One of the first things that's helpful for, for us to realize is that we all kind of have a personality when it comes to our finances. A lot of times we don't think of it that way. Um, you know, most of us aren't taught much about money. There can be a lot of shame and embarrassment about how we're handling our money. And it starts a lot of times with how we view the world. You know how people look at the glass and you always hear that comment about, you know, do you see the glass as half empty or half full? And, you know, that's to determine if you're an optimist or a pessimist. Um, but there's another version of that, which is really that opportunity is what we create, that we all have the same the same glass and with the same amount of water when it comes to time and learning about finances. We may not all have the same amount of money, of course, but we have the same opportunity to decide how we're going to put it to work for us instead of pinging off of it and just reacting. So there's a lot of steps that we want to look at. Well, not a lot, but there's a few important steps, I should say, when it comes to managing our money. And one of the first things that we end up helping a lot of people with is to just face the truth about what they're spending, what's coming in, what's going out, and how much debt do you actually have? What are the interest rates on those credit cards? And so most financial professionals will have you start with something like that. And then here's where a lot of people um, never follow through because they get stuck in the shame and the embarrassment that I should have this better organized, I don't even know what some of the interest rates are on my credit cards. And we tend to then go underground and things get worse. And so a lot of times our first work with people is just facing the fact that, again, most of us didn't learn this in school. It is changing some now. So our next generation will be hopefully more financially literate. And a lot of times in our culture, we are bombarded with advertisements and things to, that are being sold, trying to be sold to us. And so sometimes, again, people feel that guilt or shame when they lose control, you know, and we have we have 24 hours of, uh, of that now of advertising and home shopping network and QVC. And it's just so easy. Even when you go to Amazon, hey, other people that bought this liked this or when we go to, you know, buy a sweater online and, oh, this would go well with that. You know, so all the sophisticated marketing that comes at us. I'm not saying we aren't responsible, we are, but the challenges are a lot greater than they were in previous generations. So we try to help people move away from the guilt and shame 
uh, because that's not helpful, right? If we go underground, things just get worse, like they do with most challenges and problems. So trying to start off with, let's just face where we are. No judgment, just a snapshot of what's going on in your financial world. And we want to cover a few different aspects of how we can change uh, the, the way we're looking at money and what we're doing with it and how sometimes it can become a drug of choice for people that spending and shopaholic and all of that is real. People sometimes, uh, we, we saw that quite a bit during the pandemic uh, where things get out of control. So what can happen when we disagree about debt the worst thing that can happen is we end up divorcing over it. And many couples do. When we look at the statistics of why marriages fail, financial stress is typically in the top three. And, um, and that can make a huge difference in terms of um, how, how people's lives progress. Because, um, you know, if you're not on the same page, you start fighting a lot. Uh, again, things then become more secretive at times. People take it personally. If you cared about me, you wouldn't be running up the credit card or gambling. Um, and so that then can, of course, affect retirement because divorce is expensive, not to mention the human sadness and loss of that marriage that could have possibly been saved um, if the couple had been able to face their financial challenges together. And even if you're not part of a coupleship, even a single person, you can cause a lot of stress and health challenges. Um, you can affect your retirement in either of those scenarios. Um, so there's a lot of toll that debt and financial stress takes on us. Um, people can't concentrate on their job as well. People have bill collectors sometimes, you know, texting and calling them and, you know, that affecting them mentally and physically, maybe having trouble sleeping because you're so worried about your money and then not having anything able to be saved for an emergency. So when the refrigerator breaks down or you need new tires, just the stress of knowing that you have no cushion for any of those kinds of things. So there's a lot of reasons why uh, we all benefit when we get a better handle on our financial situation. And we look at our money as something that can either control us or we can control it. And so how do we know we're in trouble? Well, it's different with everybody. You may not have everything on this list, but some red flags to look out for. Are you just paying the minimum on your credit card bills? Only the least amount you can get by with and you're not really chipping away at the balance. Um, are you continuing to use your credit cards even though that's the case? And so you're going into more debt and those totals are adding up. Are you not able to make payments some months and getting assessed a late fee and, and having to try to catch up in other months? Um, are you overdrawing your account? You know, uh, again, just not being on top of what's owed, what's due when. Are you dipping into your savings to pay for daily expenses? Our savings should be for emergencies or long-term goals that we have or short-term goals that we're managing like vacation or something like that. Um, but we shouldn't be hitting our savings to pay rent, for example, or to help out an adult child who should be managing their own finances and we're getting caught up maybe in enabling them. Um, are you getting multiple notices about bills, late notices, late fees? Has it become something that's really hard to talk about? Again, that guilt and shame thing that kicks in. And maybe there's, you know, you know that it's the elephant in the living room in your household, but it's not being discussed. Are you looking for other ways to make money, which is not a bad thing. Sometimes that is part of a plan to get out of debt, but a lot of times people then spend more or they become reliant on that overtime. I know that's not so much an issue in your environment, but maybe with your spouse or partner or maybe doing a side job or something else to try to make more money. And if that is part of a bigger picture to dig our way out of debt, absolutely nothing wrong with that or to save for a special purchase or, or uh, Christmas or something like that. But if it becomes a way to then just spend more, that's when that can be a red flag. And when we're running through our savings, our savings balance is going down lower and lower, or we're using one credit card to get an advance to try to pay off another debt. Um, those are all things that can happen to people, including floating checks, bouncing checks, borrowing from people. Um, all of those can be signs that we're in trouble 
and we need to stop and take a pause and possibly get some help to sort out what's actually happening. Um, again, it's an easy cycle to get into. It's very common and it's a sign of strength to ask for help. So again, when we can, we can help people kind of come out of the shadows and say, you know, it's okay to, to get help. Let's talk about what's going on. Just like any other skill, you know, you probably at one point didn't know how to use a computer until somebody showed you. Maybe there's other times in your life where you can think about when you, you didn't have the knowledge or the skills for something and now you do. So if we think about money management the same way, it's a skill, it's coachable, it's teachable. What every household needs is a spending plan. And some people like that phrase better than a budget. It's kind of like an eating plan compared to a diet, right? Sometimes when people hear the word budget, they think of, oh, I'm going to be deprived of all the fun stuff I like to do. Um, but you're in control. You're driving the bus. It's really just to help you know where your money's going and so that you can make conscious, intentional decisions uh, about what you want to spend your money on. And a good rule is to have some money that's taken out of your paycheck that's for you and your savings. And it's better if we don't even see this money, if it's just set up on auto draft, you'll hear this from every financial professional. That's the best way to build up a savings. Don't even let it end up in your paycheck. Have a percentage that you've already figured out works for you and have it go into a savings account auto draft. The other thing we want to do is pay attention to how we're shopping. You know, are we doing impulse buying? Um, just looking at something being a good buy a lot of times can, um, can result in a purchase when maybe that's not even what we went to the store for in the first place or what we logged on to shop for. So kind of think of it like a horse with blinders on, like really trying to just focus on what you went there to get. And think of it as a game, as a challenge. I'm going to know that they're trying to, to trick me. They're trying to get me to buy other things. And if you do see something you really like, you can always put it in your cart. You can make a note of it. You can file it away until you've had 24 hours to think about, does that really fit your spending plan? Is that really important compared to your vacation or your new living room or whatever it is that is motivating you for your savings? Um, it's best, as I said earlier, if we don't rely on an additional uh, source of income for our regular daily um, uh, debt, expenses, I should say. Um, now, I'm not talking about alimony or child support or things like that. If it's regular or occurring monthly and you're set up for that, of course, we want to include that as part of a spending plan. But if we do seasonal work, we tutor on the side or we work retail during the holiday season, uh, we don't want to count on that money as part of our spending plan because it's what we call variable money versus fixed, right? It's going to possibly change. We don't know for sure it's going to be there. And again, we just want to be thoughtful about how does that fit into my overall plan? Um, so if you're working with a financial professional, they can help you sort that out. Does that make sense for you? Or, or is that exhausting you and creating other problems in your life? Uh, that all has to be looked at. We also want to pay attention to looking at our bank statements. A lot of us are so used to everything being online and we don't get paper statements anymore that we skip that step of just looking at them. Um, you may have heard of, you know, fraud that is very easy to have to happen, especially if the people doing the fraud, um, they develop some very slick techniques like maybe just drafting a dollar out of your account where you maybe don't remember what that dollar something is for, maybe $10. Um, they've determined at what number will people likely just let it go and say, oh, I'm sure I ordered something, right? And of course, all that adds up and they're able to skim off accounts by doing that. So get in the habit of looking at your bank statements, make sure all those charges are your own um, if you don't recognize them. To, uh, to ask for proof that those are your cards that are your charges. And then conventional wisdom for many years has been that it's better to own our homes versus renting. Uh, there's some different schools of thought about that now. Um, so you want again to have a financial professional talk to you about your specific situation. Is it better for you to own or rent? Because now a lot of times, more often than not, we hear the response, it depends, right? What do you want? If you want the freedom to 
come and go and not be responsible for maintenance, taxes, expenses, then renting can be a viable option for you. If you're someone who's going to stay in one place for a long time, enjoy being a homeowner, like to work in the yard, don't mind the investment in those other things because you're hoping to build equity and eventually pay off your house, um, then maybe home ownership is right for you. Um, but again, that's something a lot of people are looking at differently than they did years ago. Most of us have way too many credit cards than we really need. You know that great question, what's in your wallet? Um, a lot of times we get compulsive about accepting offers, about taking the store credit card for a discount instead of using a credit card that we already have. And it's easier to get overextended uh, when we have too many. Most experts recommend no more than three to five. I mean, if there's a good reason to have the upper amount of that, uh, most of us can get by with just three. Um, and so that can be really helpful for being conscious of which one you're, you're using, what you're putting on that. Um, if you have automatic payments, better to put on a credit card than a debit card because you can dispute those. And, and if there is any fraud, it doesn't expose your entire checking or savings account. So credit cards have their place. Uh, they can be a great way to manage cash flow. If there's an expense we have today and you know we're not going to be able to pay for it till later in the month, but limiting how many we have really helps us as we use them in, in ways that work better for us. Um, and I mentioned gambling earlier, that can really be a problem for people. And then they, they get in a cycle. I've seen people get in trouble with lottery tickets. I've seen people get in trouble with the online gaming. Um, and so again, we want to be very mindful about how that can accumulate and how that can then create more debt. And people then just like with other drugs, have to use more to get the same high or to try to get themselves out of that. So those are just some general themes. We're going to drill down on some more specifics, but I just wanted to give you kind of an overview of what are the things that we want to focus on. So the first order of business, once we face our guilt and shame and decide that's not helping me any, I'm just going to face reality, take a few deep breaths. Let me look at what's actually going on in my life. And what most experts recommend is that if you're starting from a place where you're not sure, or even if you just want to verify that your spending plan matches what's actually happening, keep track of your expenses for just one month. Um, it can be a tedious exercise to log things, but there's lots of good online tools. Um, most of the banking institutions, credit unions will offer you a free tool. There's also mint.com. Um, Quicken that some people like if you like an online version, but if you're somebody that just likes old fashioned pen and paper and you like to keep a notebook, whatever's going to work for you is what's going to work best. So be mindful to not get caught up in what somebody else uses or tells you that you should use. Some people do spreadsheets. Some people use one of the software programs, but the goal is to know where our money is going uh, to know exactly where it's going. Um, and a month gives us an idea to see that picture. Um, we then want to be realistic. Once I see what I'm spending, there may be some things I choose to do differently. Um, you probably heard a few years back about the latte factor. You know, if I go to Starbucks or I choose to eat out lunch instead of bring my own, or maybe I'm going to eat out twice a week instead of five times a week. Those are all things we can tweak and change once we know where our money is going because we wanna be realistic and reasonable. If there's payments that we make annually, we wanna allocate that amount each month so that when it's time to pay taxes or pay insurance, we have that set aside. Um, so we definitely wanna be reasonable, you know, to say that I'm never gonna eat out. You know, it's probably not realistic for most of us, um, but it definitely gives us a chance to prioritize. What are the most important things to you? How does that align with your values? You know, could you make a gift instead of buy one? Um, you know, depending on what's important to you, some people really like to save up for vacation and go on a big trip. Some people would be happy to do a staycation, play in their own backyard and use that money to remodel a bathroom or, you know, something else that they would enjoy. So again, we're not trying to line up with uh, everybody else. We're just trying to see what is important to us. And then how can I make sure that my spending habits reflect those priorities. 
And we want to be flexible. You know, life does give us curveballs or something comes our way and we say, wow, you know, I'd really like to take piano lessons, you know. Okay, how can I work that into my spending plan? That wasn't in the, that, I, that wasn't something I was aware of months ago. So uh, that flexibility allows us to make decisions that work well for us and our families. And so when we start looking at our spending plan, also known as a budget, we want to start with our household. What is it that we're actually going to spend money on? And we want to be in agreement with the other adults that we're in relationship with, because that's where a lot of spending plans hit a rough spot. As I said at the beginning, you know, couples fighting about it, not agreeing, one person sabotaging the other. And in a lot of couples, it's common for one person to be more of a saver and one person to be more of a spender. I know I watched my parents struggle with this. You know, my stepfather would go out and buy a motorcycle and a boat. And, you know, he and my mom had to work through some of that because he wouldn't talk to her first. He'd just get excited about a new toy. And she was much more of a saver and a planner and keeping an eye on where things were. So, of course, they're going to collide. They're going to make each other look opposite. And again, even if you're a single person, you can still have those two parts inside yourself that want to spend, that want to save. And so uh, there's tricks we can do to try to manage those impulses, really think through what we're considering investing in and buying. And am I really going to be thrilled if I do this? Just slowing down the train goes a long way. So we have a chance to act and not react. And we want to make sure we have a, our budget for food. And we also include some measure of eating out, assuming you're going to do some. And uh, not to forget entertainment, which most of us have forgotten about the last year and a couple of months. There hasn't been a lot of that, but things are opening up again now. There's starting to be concerts. There's starting to be festivals and travel that can happen. And we want to resist the, uh, the impulse to, uh, to do more than what our spending plan will allow because we have felt so deprived the last year, especially. So it's okay to reward ourselves, to enjoy getting back out there, but we want to be mindful. We want to be doing it on purpose instead of it just happening and then we wait for the smoke to clear and see where we are. Um, think about conserving. You know, uh, a lot of people save a lot of money on their utility bills by setting their thermostat uh, a little higher so their air conditioning doesn't kick on as fast. Um, most utility companies will come out and do a free audit for you. They'll show you where you might be getting some drain that can affect uh, your electricity bill, your utility bills. And definitely we wanna be free of debt. You know, we used to think, oh, if I just made more money, a lot of people still think this way. They envy people that are millionaires or celebrities, but guess what? The more we have, the more we spend. You know, people get promoted, they get a raise and they just raise what they're spending. Uh, not everybody, but it's rare to find people who will put that extra money into savings, uh, keep living on what you were living on. And when they look at people who've been wildly successful managing their money, that's their secret. They live below their means. They don't expand and get fancier when they're making more money. So paying down debt is one of the best ways we can create that freedom for ourselves where we're living within our means, we're owning what we have, or we're choosing to rent, but we have that, that line item in our budget, and we're not wasting our money paying interest. So if you use your credit card and you pay it off by the end of the month or when the bill comes, you know you already have, have used that budget. Um, I heard a trick once about going ahead and deducting that from your checkbook or your checking account online so that you know that money has to be paid when the bill comes in, just as if I had paid cash for it. I'm just using my credit card because I didn't have the cash right this minute. So how can we stretch our money? Most everybody wants to save as much as they can. Again, buy nothing that you cannot afford. If you can't pay it off when that credit card bill comes in, it means you, you can't afford it right now. Doesn't mean you can never have it. And sometimes we have to talk to the little kid inside ourselves or the inner teenager that wants it now, 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 you know, we have to practice some deferred gratification, uh, figure out when we can afford it. We set aside the money, we save up for it, we can get it. Um, a lot of people spend a lot of money on new cars. And again, the people who do the best managing their money uh, drive older cars, don't necessarily replace it until they have to. 
Now, again, that may not be for you. You may be somebody who gets super excited about a new car, even if it comes with a car payment and insurance and all of that. If that's important to you, that's great. Then you make your spending plan support that. If you can get by with an older car and that's going to free up something for, that, for money for something you care more about, like getting your kids in a private school or going on vacation or what would that be for you? I shouldn't say a private school. I'm talking to public school here. There's nothing better than you guys. But let's say you want to take a trip instead or you want to remodel your house. You know, what would be important to you? Maybe you love clothes. So finding those things in your spending plan of where you want to spend your money allows us to then maybe compromise in another area. And if you are going to be a homeowner, uh, a tip is to, again, buy less than you can afford. That's a little challenging right now with it being such a hot seller's market. It can be a challenge with the bidding wars that are going on, but that's going to cycle. You know, every economic cycle uh, changes. And when it is right for you to buy, if that's what you want to do, some experts say buy what you could buy on one salary. Some people say, wow, that's too uh, much of a, a, a decrease, maybe a salary and a half. So that if something happened and one person couldn't work, if you are coupled up, that you would have some cushion and you wouldn't be overextended on your mortgage. Um, and another thing is to just think about how grateful we are for our jobs. A lot of times we, we um, deflate the importance and the excitement of the job that we do have. And focusing on those positives uh, helps put in motion gratitude, which helps us feel less deprived which helps us appreciate, you know what, this paycheck is making all of these cool things possible in my life. So it just gives us a different mindset. Again, I mentioned earlier about starting that automatic savings. That could be a takeaway if you're not already doing that. Pay yourself first. Put what you need to in savings so you're not tempted to spend it if it shows up in your, in your, in your uh, paycheck. Some people like a piggy bank. And they put change in there. Whenever you get change back in, from the uh, store, um, just put the change in that jar or that piggy bank. And then you can go to one of those great machines that'll calculate it for you. And it all adds up. And people sometimes have hundreds of dollars that they can spend on something fun just from putting away the coins. Um, definitely, definitely focus on your credit card debt. The goal is to zero it out. Maybe not overnight if you've let it accumulate and you're, you're feeling overwhelmed with that. You want to reach out to a financial expert, maybe somebody at your bank or credit union, maybe somebody on the EAP team. I mentioned the financial professionals we have. We do this all day long, help people sort out what they owe and what would be a repayment plan that won't hurt too much. Maybe you make some sacrifices in the short run and then figuring out which ones to pay off first uh, some people adhere to the school of thought of pay off the one with the highest interest rate because it's costing you the most. Some people want to pay off the one with the smallest amount of debt. So they get that victory lap sooner than later, and that encourages them to keep going. So depending on what kind of person you are and what matters the most to you, it doesn't really matter as long as we're making an effort uh, regularly to get that debt down. And then we don't want to mis make the mistake of piling on more debt while we're trying to get out from under it. So some people put their credit cards where they're harder to reach. Um, I've even heard, you know, stick them in the freezer, you know, or put them at least in the next room in a drawer where you've got to really think about charging something on the, that credit card that you're trying to pay down. Because we don't want to cancel out our efforts. You know, we just paid $100 and then we charge it back up. And many times people are in that cycle of, well, I still have credit left, right? I still have room on this card, um, but that's the wrong way to think about uh, credit and debt. Uh, it's really something that imprisons us when, we, when we're in debt. It keeps us from reaching our goals. So again, we can have some fun with this. We can actually feel empowered about spending our money. When you think about telling those dollars what to do, you're in charge instead of uh, being at their mercy. And, uh, you know, when you're in a store or even when you're shopping online, like the examples I gave of the online, there's all kinds of temptations to do impulse buys. Impulse buys are things that we did not go online or go to the store to get or did not turn on the TV to hear about. 
and yet it's so tempting. We get bombarded even in social media with all different advertisements for things that look really cool. Um, if you can adopt a rule that you're going to think about it for 24 hours, if it's a small purchase, if it's a major purchase, a week, and really step back and see if you still want it, see if your budget will allow for it or your spending plan, see if there's a used version instead of new, see if you might be able to barter with somebody. There's all kinds of things we can do. And if we come back and we really want it and it works, then we go ahead and let ourselves do it. What if we get a curveball? I know for most of us, we've been fortunate enough to still be employed the whole time, but sometimes we have family members where they haven't been as fortunate. They've been furloughed. Uh, we've seen a lot of people struggle during these times. Uh, if that happens to you, you definitely want to implement um, you know, emergency uh, tools for helping yourself stay afloat. So when we purchase off-brand, we can get our medications generically instead of name brand. And those are good things to do, even if we are still employed and nothing unexpected has happened. Those are good practices to explore how you can save more money. And again, remember the more we save, the more we can save, not the more we spend. So if we find those opportunities to reduce our cable or eliminate it, you know, a lot of people have done that and, and just used streaming service and saved a lot of money. Um, that may be something you've been procrastinating. You know, find things like that where there might be some, some money you could find. Um, a lot of times there are, of course, the holidays from the taxes, typically around back to school time. And that can be a great time to make a purchase that, that fits in that category so you can save on taxes. Uh, some people have gotten very creative uh, about carpooling or doing some uh, different things to try to save gas and enjoy somebody's company. If, both your kids have, you know, a, a soccer game somewhere, you know, again, we're so used to in our country of doing everything solo and, and being very well off. Um, but people from previous generations know that it's really important to also get in the habit of, you know, there could be a time where we need to do something different. And if we're already used to that, uh, combining trips, not necessarily, you know, we've just had, a, of course, a big gas scare with prices and all of that. Uh, we get very spoiled to just driving our car as many times as often as we want. And definitely taking our lunch, uh, maybe not every single day so you don't burn out on it, but just being mindful. How many times a week are you actually going to eat out instead of it just happening um, accidentally without us thinking about it? And we also want to look at things that maybe are not so critical to have. There's difference between wants and needs. And that's a good exercise that we use with young children even to draw a line down the page. What's a want and what's a need? And, um, you know, sometimes those things get blurried in our spending plan and we're not necessarily focused on the things that, um, you know, that we need to plan for, that they're, they're a desire, but they're not absolutely something we have to have. Uh, we definitely want to get that savings going for emergencies. Uh, most of the experts recommend three to six months um, of your take home pay. Uh, would be a good goal to have in the bank for uh, savings, for emergencies. Um, for some things, you know, we want to keep our momentum going. We want to keep motivated. So if we start trying to live too lean and we cut back so many things, we make ourselves miserable. We tend to sabotage ourselves and just give up and go back to the way we were. Same thing happens with eating plans and diets, you know. Think of it as the same in money world, you know. In the food world, if I say from now on, I'm just going to eat salads, you know, that typically isn't maintainable and, you know, we end up getting discouraged and quitting. And the same thing can happen financially. So don't set the control so tight that it makes you miserable and, and you're not something that you're going to be able to maintain. Um, again, I've seen a lot of people actually having some fun with this, you know, who've been through a Ramsey class or found something online that works for them. Um, and we always want to be mindful of our retirement goals as well. Sometimes that's the first thing that can get cut or borrowed from. Um, so again, a good financial professional can help you look at these things. We really want to pay attention to our spending. You know, does this really match my goals, what I want to be doing? Um, if you are a homeowner, um, from time to time, look at refinancing as interest rates change. We haven't had a lot of that lately, but in certain cycles, it can make sense to think about refinancing. How about shopping insurance? Once a year, look at your car insurance, your homeowner's insurance, even your cell phone bill. 
cable, all of those things that can be shopped and re-evaluated based on usage. Uh, some people do adjust their withholding. There's different schools of thought about that. Some people like getting a big income tax refund. Depends on what you do with it, right? If you're, if you're able to use that toward your goals, um, that can be an okay thing to do. Other people feel like, oh no, that's an interest-free loan to the government. I'm gonna claim more uh, and I'm going to have less withheld from my check. So different ways to structure that, again, depending on what's going on. And as we get to our wrap up place here, just a real quick illustration of the dangers of credit. When we buy something, I'm working with a couple of mentees on this now and helping them understand that you know, if we buy something on credit uh, that we're gonna pay off over time and it looks like a really low payment and um, we have a lot of car loans that are in this category now, but look how much we've paid for example, for this $800 TV, when you factor all of that in, if I just made the minimal payments and I let almost 22% interest pile up, you know, I will have paid almost double for this TV versus if I had just saved for it or made it into less payments, uh, again, intentionally, where I know what I'm getting into. So it requires some discipline, again, which some people frown upon, but a lot of times once we get in the habit of it, as I said, it actually can become fun to see our money grow, to see ourselves be able to meet goals. So think about reducing the number of charge accounts that you do have, the credit cards, as I said, you can go back and, and uh, get some financial advice, look at what you really need, which ones do you like, which ones have the best interest rates, or do you like not paying an annual fee, do you like rewards and cash back? Um, some people have their credit card tied to an airline for points. So again, it's just a matter of being strategic about it. Which ones do you want to have? Um, and then we want to be careful about going into debt, really taking our time to buy ourselves a little bit of time uh, to really think about if that's what we want to do. We can also sometimes pay part credit, part cash, if that works for you. And again, we want to keep our savings going. We want to make it a little harder to pull out that credit card and use it so quickly. Make sure you're looking at what your spending is about um, and that it's something you can pay off pretty quickly. Um, everybody can get a free credit report now annually. Um, there are some bogus sites out there that'll try to hijack you and, and sell you a credit cleanup service. So make sure you're going to annualcreditreport.com. That's the official legitimate one. And um, you can also put checks and balances on your credit card so that it makes it harder for somebody to open an account, which can help with fraud, but it can also help you with self-discipline if you want to do that. So in Health Advocate, you also have on our website, healthadvocate.com, you'll find a financial fitness center, which is really cool. You can do a little checkup um, on some of the topics that we've been talking about today. You'll find that little quiz there. You'll find some recommendations, articles, assessments, all kinds of great resources that are on the uh, website as well. And this checkup is really cool. It only takes about 10 minutes to take it and you'll get some recommendations specifically to you. And you'll also get a, a little score that kind of tells you how you're doing with managing your money, uh, what kind of stress you're experiencing about money. So there's tools available right on the website that can help you with that as well. Um, all the, the courses that we have have a little quiz at the end. You can even print out a certificate. So again, you can enjoy learning more about building your emergency fund or if you're in the market for a home, um, you know, what are those things that can help you increase your knowledge and skills? And again, our goal is to shed shame that, you know, again, most of us didn't grow up learning all of this and just like we would need to learn anything else. And then we really want to work on our stress because stress can be such a driver of poor financial decisions, right? I'm sure we've all had the experience of, you know, being depressed and then, you know, making some purchase or buying a bunch of clothes or going on a trip unexpectedly. And, you know, we want to try to keep our stress low, know what's going on with ourselves, uh, be as healthy as possible so that we're not acting out of some of the, those emotions that can get in the way of our better judgment. Our goal is to have balance as much as we can. We're probably not going to hit it in every single area of our life all at the same time. But the healthier that we feel overall, am I getting enough rest? Am I, do I have some, some fun in my life? Am I making nutritious food choices most of the time? 
Do I have something to look forward to? Um, am I giving back in some way that feels spiritual to me? If I've got a good foundation, I'm going to be in a better place to make healthier financial choices. So again, our attitude has a lot to do with it. What we tell ourselves, you know, I wish I had more money. I don't have enough. Um, you know, I deserve this. I've had a hard day. Um, those kinds of that, those kinds of thoughts can get us in trouble and lead us down a road of making choices uh, that aren't necessarily in our best interest versus saying, I can do this. I'm going to tackle it one thing at a time. Maybe I know somebody who's really good at budgeting or spending plans. Maybe I'm going to make myself vulnerable and reach out for help. But those kinds of things really help us a lot. And to set boundaries. You know, again, sometimes our stress is self-inflicted. We're saying yes to so many commitments and really exhausting ourselves. And, and then again, we're not in the best shape to make financial decisions. That's when we're more, more vulnerable to advertising and things like that. So um, definitely make sure you have your own self-care plan going. Uh, stress is a huge part of um, compulsive spending. And I am going to stop sharing now. And so we can come back together and have some Q&A, share some best practices, what's working well for you. Um, absolutely. So we have a few minutes left. And um, if you want to unmute, you can do that. If you don't, you can use the chat and I will get to as much as I can in the time we have. Okay, does anybody have any questions they want to unmute and ask? Or if you would like to share anything that's helping you and your family, um, you can feel free to do that at this time. And again, sorry that we got started a little bit late, but we did record it. And we're gonna put that, uh, that out there for everybody so that if you had to go, you'll be able to do that. Um, the health advocate phone number, just in case you didn't get that at the beginning of the session, this is the number that I recommended you keep handy in case you need some follow up for financial assistance or emotional assistance or anything else going on in your life, including the advocacy services. It is 855-424-8400. Um, you have one to six free confidential sessions per issue per year. Thank you so much. So much. Thank you, Cindy. This was great. I'm back in the office now and um, glad to hear it. So some great tips. I don't think I'd seen the, the score thing in action before for the financial center. I think that's really good. Great. Um, useful, great. useful tool there. Yes, that definitely yeah. has been very popular. All right, great. Well, we're gonna we are recording this, so we had a lot of people miss it because of the the building issue and whatever else, and being in the classroom. So, um, if they have any questions, I'll be sure to have them reach out and uh, and get some help. Sounds good. Thank you all so much. Enjoyed being with you today, and uh, good luck with your financial journey. We're here for you. Thank you. Thank you, Carly, and thank you, Amanda. Thank you.